SJC 12475, Nothing Commonwealth versus Loya. Mr. Reardon, good morning. Good morning, Your Honors. Theodore Reardon on behalf of the defendant, Adrian Lawyer. The first issue presented is whether the jury verdict slips in this case should have framed the issue for the jury as to whether or not the Commonwealth had proven its case beyond a reasonable doubt, instead of what happened in here where the jury was charged that uh, does the jury find the defendant guilty or not guilty. Equating the, um, equating the failure to prove the case to not guilty is a false equivalency because insufficient evidence of guilt is tantamount to saying the defendant is innocent. Mr. And Mr. Ridden, the, the guilty but insane um, that you propose, a number of states have it. Is it usually by statute or has, has some of it arisen through common law like you're asking us to do? Um, I've been, most of it is by statute. The one case that I was able to find that it was by common law was Alabama, and I cited the Williams versus State case. Um, and I think uh, the, the statute in that case actually does talk in terms of um, uh, not guilty by reason of insanity, but the common law has interpreted it to be guilty. Um, but insane. Yes, right, right. So yeah, so that's the second issue in the case is um, that uh, the jury should have heard the issue as being guilty but not criminally responsible. And the reason why that's significant in this case is this is an especially egregious set of facts. And it would, I think a jury, a juror would be hard pressed to associate this defendant with the term not guilty. However, it is much more palatable for them to find the defendant is guilty but not criminally responsible. You're not basically saying that there was any error according to the law as it existed at the time of the trial, are you? Correct, I'm not. So you're asking for us to change the law? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so that's the second issue. As to the first issue about the, um, uh, the jury being asked whether or not the Commonwealth has proven its case beyond a reasonable doubt. And uh, defense counsel had requested uh, that the verdict slip be uh, phrased in that way. Um, unfortunately, at the jury charge conference, he didn't follow up on that. But there is a substantial likelihood of a miscarriage of justice in not wording the, the slips in that way. As defense counsel said at the outset, the sole issue in this case is criminal responsibility. There were four experts who testified on that issue. The Commonwealth's own expert testified favorably to the defense. The jury was out three days deliberating on this issue. The experts were, were divided, weren't they? They were two and two. That's correct, yes. It wasn't like they were all even the same diagnosis for this man. Right. But yes. the, the Commonwealth hired Kelly, and Kelly yes. went for your client. Yes. Yes. So the jury deliberated over three days over, undisputedly, the only issue in the case, criminal responsibility. And if the jury had in front of them verdict slips that phrased the issue of, has the Commonwealth proven its case beyond a reasonable doubt, it may well have made a difference instead of the issue being, was the defendant guilty versus not guilty? We don't generally we don't have special verdicts in criminal cases. We have general verdicts in criminal cases. I mean, by your standard, we have to go through each element of the offense. Uh, no, not necessarily. That wasn't the, the uh, what the defense uh, was necessarily requesting. What he was requesting was instead of it being phrased in term of is the defendant guilty or not guilty, it would instead say has the Commonwealth proven the, its case or the elements of its case beyond a reasonable doubt. It wouldn't necessarily go through each element and say, have they proven this, this, and this. But I, I assume Judge Nickerson, if he's using his usual care, provided instructions telling the jury they may not find any element of the offense and they may not find him criminally responsible unless they prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he was criminally responsible. He did. But, but that leads to the interesting point that the verdict slip really doesn't conform to the verbal instructions given by the judge. The judge phrases it as, as usual, that the Commonwealth has this burden and they need to prove, prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. But yet, the question that's written on the verdict slip is a different one. Is the defendant guilty or not guilty? Well, well he, I guess he's not guilty if, if the, Commonwealth, it's a, uh, the Commonwealth bears that burden when it's fairly raised and if, if the defendant, Commonwealth fails to meet the burden, 
he's not guilty, right? That is, that's true, but the issue really before the jury is, has the Commonwealth proven its case beyond a reasonable doubt? That's what all the instructions are, are focusing in on. Right, in, including within that, has the Commonwealth proven his sanity? Yes, correct, yes. yes. If there are no further questions, Your Honors. Thank you for taking this case. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Sweeney. Good morning, may it please the court, Elizabeth Sweeney for the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth respectfully requests that this court affirm the defendant's conviction where the defendant has not shown a substantial likelihood of a miscarriage of justice. The jury was properly instructed on the law of criminal responsibility. The judge's instructions begin on volume nine, page 696. The verdict slips reflected the appropriate verdict options and the defendant's proposed instructions were incorrect as a matter of law where it overstated the Commonwealth's burden of proof, it complicated the standard of criminal responsibility, and the verdict slips that they proposed were legally incorrect. And it's the Commonwealth's position that the changes that the defendant advocates for today is really an issue for the legislature. It's a common law and also statutory-based um, issue that we're dealing with today. And if this court was to um, change the standard of criminal responsibility, I suggest that the legislature should have some impact on that. The defendant has not shown um, any likelihood of a miscarriage of justice. The jury was properly, completely instructed by Judge Nickerson on criminal responsibility. The Commonwealth's burden was stated multiple times. Defense counsel did not object to, um, to the instructions or to the verdict slips as drafted. We see an odd grin that we, uh, while we don't require a specific order in jury instructions, it's generally preferable to instruct on the elements of a defense to a crime after describing the elements of the crime. Is that what happened here? I'm sorry, can you, I couldn't hear you. I'll read it again. In Odgren, we said, although we do not, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Although we do not require a specific order in jury instructions, we reiterate that, quote, it is generally preferable to instruct on the elements of a defense to a crime after describing the elements of the crime. Is that what happened here? I believe so, yes. The judge um, instructed on criminal responsibility, the elements of the crime, the Commonwealth's boot, uh, burden of proof to um, prove the defendant guilty and the definitions of not guilty and guilty. But first the elements and then the, and then the, uh, uh, what's the uh, lack of criminal defense, uh, then, then, then the defense? Uh, it's my understanding, yes. Okay, so that was the, the order, the right order it was in. I, I believe so. But in our latest homicide instructions, model homicide instructions, criminal responsibility goes first, correct? It, it does. And, and that wasn't the case here? Um, I. Actually, I do believe the judge instructed on criminal responsibility, and then they broke for lunch, and then he got into the elements of the offense. Um, that's what Judge Nickerson did. They, they broke right after the long um, criminal responsibility instruction, went to lunch, did the, um, did the elements of the offense, and then um, Defense Attorney Drew Segadelli um, said that the instructions were fine and said no objection on the record. So that was, he was prescient. That was in conformity what we now yes, have asked yes, to do. Yes, yes, exactly. So the only thing that comes that I look at in this case is the rather unusual idea of Dr. Martin Kelly saying I, um, that the person is not criminally responsible. That uh, I can't say that I've ever seen that before. Uh, so that's our 33E review. What, how, how do we? What meaning, if anything, do we do we take for that? So in this case, there were two experts that said the defendant was criminally responsible. Two that said they were not. Um, Dr. Kelly actually recommended Dr. Edersheim to our office, and under 33E, the uh, court does not act as necessarily for this issue a second jury. I rely on Commonwealth v. Johnson for that um, proposition, and the jury was willing, it was instructed to analyze the, uh, the opinions of the experts and make their own determination. Um, Dr. Kelly's argument about um, that the defendant had Asperger's, had a high functioning level of autism um, was addressed in Dr. Edersheim's testimony. She explained um, her um, understanding of that issue and why the defendant would not fall under that category and the jury was free to accept or decline her or Dr. Kelly's opinion. And I'll, and I'll uh, correct the record. There are a number of instances where Dr. Kelly's found people not criminally responsible. Mm. But. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if there's no further questions, I rest on my brief. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>